Hey guys, welcome back to Better From The Ground Up. Today we're going to talk about gene expression analysis. Every morning when you get up, you run up the flag, it says balance nutrition, and you salute it every morning. That's what I'm here to do today. That's my strategy. There's no magic program for everybody. It's about identifying what's most limiting and fixing it. So it's amazing what the crop can do when your nutrition is squared away and everything's good and adequate and balanced. Hey guys, Cody Goins here. Uh, today we're going to talk with Dr. Lane Ellen about gene expression analysis. Um, so, uh, Dr. Lane Ellen, would you tell us a little bit about um, your background, how you got into this, and then a little bit about your company and the kind of research work that you do? Sure. Well, thanks so much for having me. My name is Lane Ellen Harris. I own and operate Foresight Agronomics. We are a research consulting firm that our goal and our mission is really to demystify biologicals and uh, provide reliability and credibility in researching those products so that ag suppliers and growers can feel really good about their product recommendations and investments. We utilize a specific type of um, analysis called transcriptomic analysis or a study of gene expression mm -hmm. to understand how biological products are actually impacting plants. We can use that information to identify um, modes of action of those products to see uh, we can see if the like how long the effect lasts we can see when in the plants and the crops life cycle you need to make sure and get your application in based on what the genes are doing at those times I mean there's there's so many questions we can figure out rates efficacy all kinds of things from understanding how really complex products like biologicals are impacting um, plants and how they respond to those. Gotcha. Um, and that, um, how did you, how'd you get into that? So my background, um, I worked for a, a private company for many years trying to understand how gene expression could be used for product development. Uh, specifically, this was in biopesticides. And, um, but honestly, it started back when I was a kid. We gardened a lot. I was really fascinated with how plants grew and could make food that we can eat. And I'm a big fan of eating food. So, yep. you know, it, it all kind of came together. Um, and, I'm also really fascinated with genetics and how plants are so adaptive and responsive and biologicals present a lot of new questions for us, I think, in agriculture and a real opportunity to figure out new products, new methods. But there's a big gap between what we where we want to be, I think, with biologicals and our understanding of them and where we actually are. And so it all really came together Um I left that company, started my own company, um, and I work with people like you to try and understand how our products are working, and it's it's really great. It's a lot of fun. Perfect. Um, your PhD, you told me three times, is in <laughs> what? So my PhD, technically my PhD is in integrated plant and soil sciences, and okay. then I have a focus in plant molecular biology. Okay, got it. So you're smarter than I am. You know, I wouldn't say that. This. You know a lot more about this than I do. Um, so uh, you mentioned, um, obviously, that's what we we're trying to do. That's what attracted me to your company when I saw, um, I think I saw you on LinkedIn. Probably. Right? Um, ex talking about explaining how biologicals work on a very, very, very specific level. And like you said, you know, oh, we're getting this response. Well, to what degree are you getting that response? And what's that mean? And what you, uh, you and I first talked, you were like, well, you can also see how long that lasts. Um, do you get a response in three days or is it 10 days or is it 14 days? How long does that last? Um, and so we, I was really interested in that because I feel like we we do a really good job of understanding how our products work, but there's a big difference in knowing what you see in the field and what you see on like plant tissue samples with nutrient status, which is what we focus a lot on. Um, and then getting into gene expression. It's like, well, this is a whole nother level of overwhelming information, but it's really cool to be able to see that specific information, like just in that level of detail. I won't understand it all for sure, right? But that's why that's why you're here to, to walk me through that. And I don't know if any of us will all understand all of it. <laughs> it's, uh, it's really useful, though. So um, 
you mentioned one time um, when we first were talking, I think maybe we had already started doing some, some work, but uh, you said you can tell with like biopesticides, um, for instance, or like biological fungicides, you can tell, oh, that prompts resistance to these type of pathogens, but not to these, these type of pathogens, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Um, and so something you just went over with us was that that seems to help more with abiotic stress mitigation. And what we're seeing over here is more about biotic stress mitigation. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. And even within those, there's tons of nuance and, and different areas of strengths and weaknesses that you could go down in terms of plant immunity. Okay, gotcha. So obviously what we were trying to accomplish is we, we looked at our, our most popular product network. Um, we've had it for a long time. It's evolved and changed over the years. Um, a lot of guys have used it um, in a lot of different states that's been on you know the past five or six world records. And so we've been really impressed with the product that we developed, but we developed it more off of biology, like as far as measuring soil biology what's it doing to that and then what's that doing to plant nutrition so we've definitely never looked at it until now on a what's it doing to gene expression level um and so one thing i want to go through is just a an overview not like we don't have to go crazy in Mm -hmm. depth but you know we every everyone that we talk with knows that we use a plant growth promoter um, in network that's a proprietary plant growth promoter and um, it seemed to enhance network when we when we started adding that to the formulation but it was like i don't really know why you know i've i've got my theories but we don't really know in depth like what the difference is here so we did um we did some comparisons with that plant growth promoter by itself versus a different plant growth promoter by itself and then network as a finished product which included those plant growth promoters um and so we just went through the the initial data set right and you you tried to explain to us out of the thousand pages of of information (laughs) that we got uh what the differences were so would you maybe highlight um some of the key things that you saw out of the PGP by itself versus network as a as a finished product, which included the PGP in it? Sure, yeah. So I think one of the, um, number one, one of the interesting things that we saw was that there is a different, the response looks different at three days versus two weeks. Mm-hmm. So that's an important thing to consider uh, really across the board for the PGP on its own or in the formulation with network. Um when you're thinking about product application and application frequencies, it's important to know that what the plant responds to it, how the plant responds to it initially may not be what it's responding to it later on. Mm -hmm. Um, And it can also answer some questions about the durability of the responses. So first of all, we saw that um, these are really unique products, but the PGP on its own, functions a little bit differently than it does when it's uh, all blended together. And, and actually, I think the blend produced a really nice uh, plant growth promoting, um, photosynthesis pushing, carbon metabolism pushing, carbon fixation pushing plant at the end of the day okay. that you did not see whenever you had the PGP on its own. Right. That was astounding to me because we've talked about the PGP so much to people that I think they think like, oh, that's the magic ingredient. Right. And it's like, actually, that by itself is no comparison. Right. Basically is what you said with the PGP by itself is no comparison to network as a blended finished product, that they were very different. Yep. So that was very helpful. (laughs) Um, That's cool. So one of the other things that that you mentioned, we did this on corn, by the way, for people who are listening. So we did this on corn, and we made foliar application at V4. Um, That was the easiest starting point. Um, So what we're going to do in the future, obviously, we want to do this on soybeans. We want to use one of our other products that we commonly use on soybeans. We want to do some in-furrow applications to see what kind of differences you get? Would you expect to see, um, this may be a dumb question, but would you expect to see pretty different results um, as far as the genes that you're impacting and how much you're impacting them on soybeans versus corn? 
Could it be could it be very different or would you expect it to be similar or is it just you don't know till you try? I don't know. I mean, I hate to make any kinds of assumptions really, but mo- many of the pathways that we saw induced and and increased, I guess you could say, with uh, the blended product are very well conserved, what we call highly conserved pathways. So these are things like photosynthesis. Mm-hmm. Um, what that means is they're going to be in all our plants. crop plants have this machinery okay. across the board. Okay. Now the degree that it affects those things may be different. Okay. I wouldn't surprise me to see it still be pretty effective though. Okay. In, in both species, um, where you may see some nuance is in how sensitive a different species is to stress. So okay. if we have, which there are to some degree with network, um, some very useful stress priming mechanisms, you may see that that is stronger and more pronounced in other species. Okay. You may see a little bit more sensitivity to that. Mm-hmm. And then depending on when in the crop's life cycle you're applying it, you may see some differences okay. in, in that response. So that's kind of one the next question I was going to ask you would probably expect to see differences oh we put this in furrow or we applied it to Mm -hmm. the seed versus we applied it foliar when the plants were bigger right yeah I mean there are systemic responses that we see but um, basically whenever there are systemic responses that we know about in plant immune systems but it's not always the same depending on where you apply it on the Mm -hmm. crop. So if you think about like induced systemic resistance and systemic acquired resistance, these are two flavors of similar responses that give you a, a, a plant with enhanced resistance to certain pathogens down the road. Okay. Um, but ISR or induced systemic resistance is generally driven by plant microbes and in the roots. Mm -hmm. And it gives you a, systemic response but it's elicited in the roots okay initially okay whereas systemic acquired resistance really can be both but it's more typical i would say with foliar tissue so they're both giving you defense responses they're both probably helping you with biotrophic pathogens Mm -hmm. but they started in different ways and the intensity and durability of that response may be different okay that makes sense. so all that to say There's probably still responses, but it may differ in how that response shapes out over time. Sure. And that's what we're trying to figure out, right? Like what's, what's the perfect method of application and number of applications or the combination of method of application and number, right? So Mm -hmm. and timing is is a seed applied in two foliars perfect or, you know, is it one and one or is it four? One thing that you mentioned that I was really shocked about, you said, well, there's certain some biological products you can basically what did you call it a metabolic drag by yeah by <laughs> you can over applying it, it too frequently bit. or do I have a rate a little bit sure yeah so uh, the best example I can think of or analogy I can think of would be kind of like training for a marathon mm-hmm. so okay. I am not a runner. And if I went out and ran a marathon right now, I would have some serious metabolic drag um, and I'd be very sore. So you would see probably damaged muscle tissues and all of the things. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I do a short run Mm -hmm. over time, every day, consistently, that's going to help me a lot more in that uh, marathon at the end of the day. Right. Mm -hmm. So we see this same kind of thing happen, or at least I've seen it with many biologicals where we think, okay, maybe this single rate, let's say a pint an acre gives me X response. Mm-hmm. So I want more response. So I'm going to throw out, I don't know, 32 a, a quart. Yeah. yeah. And you don't get that one plus one equals two. You might get a drag actually, because if, if the response that you're, it really just depends on what response it is that you're eliciting in the plant. Mm-hmm. If you are, trying to prime the plant which is done through mildly stressing it Mm -hmm. you can overdo that right so there's a there's certainly i think a threshold that needs to be found with this type of priming resistance tolerance application with biologicals which is there i've seen it very effectively used Mm -hmm. but you have to really know why you're eliciting this response right in order to understand why 
doubling that rate may hurt you. Okay. Yep. That makes sense. I mean, we've, we've played around with a lot of different rates of stuff and, um, I, I haven't seen like physical damage by any means, but you always, you know, you can always get to a point where it's like, well, that didn't, that didn't even do as good. Mm -hmm. You know, that, uh, it was not like, oh, we had a disaster on our hands, but, um, I think it's, going to be shocking to people to think that with biologicals, since they're natural and safe, right. that you could do too much. Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, the plant is, the crop is, a crop is just a plant that's doing something that we want it to do, right? Mm -hmm. We're using it for food or fuel or fiber or whatever it is, but its goal is not necessarily to give us more food or fuel right. or fiber. Its goal is to grow and put out roots and build photosynthetic machinery to absorb lots of light and reproduce. Mm -hmm. So I think it's easy for us to um, kind of see plants as this like machine of inputs with expected outputs. Right. And that may be true on large scales, but not necessarily true whenever you're introducing something complicated like a biological. Right. Yep. That's uh, complicated. I, I knew biologicals were complicated already, but um, now I know that they're a lot more complicated than I even thought they were before, right? So now I'm like, oh, wow, I feel like I'm back to, I feel like it's back to square one here. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, it's fine. Um, it was really good, though. Um, so we're going to follow up with, obviously, for moving forward, we want to test a few more popular products that we have. And we want to do some in furrow versus seed application versus foliar. We, we've got a couple different crops that we want to play with. So um, I'm excited to do, do more work in the future. And be overloaded with information every time <laughs> it comes back. So, um, yep. no, well, thank you very much for joining us. It was great. Um, and to those of you that are listening, again, this is Dr. Lane Ellen, and her company is Foresight Agronomics, and she's in the great state of Kentucky. So where can people find you? LinkedIn, you've got a website. Find me on LinkedIn. Too. You can find me on my website, www.foresightagronomics. It's F-O-R-S, F-O-R-E-S-I-G-H-T, agronomics.com. Okay. Um, yeah, reach out. Have got another it. conversation. All right. Well, look forward to doing more work in the future. Thanks. This information was extremely valuable to us. So thank you. Thank you.